All right. And we are live. It's Dr. J here in the house with Evan Brand. Today, we're going to be chatting about probiotic intolerances. Why can't I tolerate my probiotics? Let's dive in. Evan, how are we doing, man? Doing really well. Excited to dive into this topic. Probiotics are one of those, uh, what do you call them? Maybe low-hanging fruit things that'll pop up on a news article or on mainstream news or maybe a TV commercial even. So your average person compared to something like using activated charcoal and berberine and those mm -hmm. kind of more nuanced functional medicine, medicine things, your average Joe Schmo probably has at least heard of probiotics. And the problem with when things become mainstream is – they lose all the disclaimers and they lose all the caveats to when these things are good. So you'll hear somebody probiotic yogurt or probiotic this. And it's like, okay, great. Probiotics must be good for you. I'm going to go take one. And then I take it. And then I run to the bathroom with diarrhea and I almost crap my pants on the way to the bathroom. I've heard that story. Why? And I'm like, okay, well, let's unpack it. So that's what today's podcast is about. 100%. So Probiotics, right? What are they? Beneficial bacteria, primarily in the family of lactobacillus, bifidobacter. Um, there are some other kind of pseudo probiotics like Saccharomyces boulardii, which is more of a beneficial yeast that can help potentiate growth of probiotics or beneficial bacteria and can help outcompete bad guys like fungus and yeast and other bad bacteria. We also have spore based probiotics, which are a little bit different, tend to be more either soil based or spore based in the family of the bacillus family, right? Bacillus clausii, Bacillus subtilis, Bacillus coagulans, Lichenformis, et cetera. And these are different types of bacteria. So typically when we talk probiotics, we're typically talking more on the bifido lactobacillus species side of the fence. Now, anthropologically, evolutionarily, we got exposed to a lot of good bacteria, whether it was from just the soil, right? Not quite cleaning our vegetables, but having some, so having some soil on that. And you get some of the bacteria in the soil on our food, hence the, the role for soil or spore-based probiotics supplementally, but primarily you get it through fermentation, with, whether it's pickles or kimchi or sauerkraut or some kind of a fermented tea that we see more in modern day kombucha. These are typical ways that we get exposed to beneficial bacteria in our diets. And this is healthy. And today we've therapeutically, you know, gone one step above by dialing in probiotics from an oral pill, whether it's VSL-3 or our different higher dose bifido or lactobacillus species, different kinds, whether it's um, lactobacillus acidophilus or paracaceae or infantis or bifidobacterium longum, et cetera, all these different species that we see that have a lot of anti-inflammatory effects according to the literature. Um, they can help reduce bacterial infections, food poisoning, uh, diarrhea. In some cases they can help improve constipation. And again, these are things that we've seen clinically, right? When you do a study, Evan and I were talking about this pre-show, you have to control a lot of variables. And let's say someone's eating probiotics or fermented foods, but their diet stinks or their sleep's crappy. There's other variables in their life that could affect things. So clinically, we've seen amazing results with probiotics. It's a powerful low-hanging fruit. But the question really today is, what happens when probiotics go bad? Why is that occurring? Meaning what happens when probiotics cause negative symptoms or side effects? Yep. You did a great, great job too, talking about the kind of the prehistoric aspect of this because, you know, the, the average skeptical person who doesn't want to buy supplements and thinks it's snake oil or whatever, they may say, well, why, why all of a sudden do we need probiotics? My grandparents didn't pro take probiotics and they lived till they were 96. And you answered it, you know, even if we don't go as far back as the hunter gatherer tribal society, even just great parent, you know, great grandparents, they're living off the land. Like my grandpa's grandpa had 350 acres. They were eating chicken right out of the backyard. They were in the soil all day. He had a horse to help him till the dirt. I'm sure he was getting his hands dirty all day and he had a great, long, healthy life. So today we're removed from that. You've got the conventional, even in the organic industry, you've got things that are happening like potentially the chickens being exposed to chlorine or just even in tap water. You know, there's all sorts of different products, chemicals, drugs, pharmaceuticals in tap water. So if you're getting this conventional organically or organically raised chicken, and it's at Whole Foods, is it better than like the factory farm stuff? Yeah, but now I'm even seeing there's these organic factory farms that a lot of Whole Foods is using where they're basically just big warehouses and they're organic feed, but they have nothing to do with being pastured. And that 
reduces the nutrient density of the animals. Of course, if you go out to a restaurant and you go get chicken fajitas, if it's not labeled or classified as being free of antibiotics or getting a dose of antibiotics, that's killing the good bacteria in your gut. So uh, there was a guy, I believe his name is Jared. I believe his last name is Leach. I think it's Jared Leach, maybe Jeffrey Leach. Um, I'll have to look it up. But anyway, it's a guy who went to East Africa and Tanzania and was looking at the guts, this whole microbiome project that he's running. And he just looked at the diversity of people's gut. And he compared typical American people versus these Hasda people who are basically eating zebra meat and tubers and honey. And the diversity of the bacteria was off the charts in these mm. people. So, so I know this is a long story and, and rant and I'm rambling, but the point was we don't have diversity in our guts anymore. So probiotics are our attempt to help increase the diversity and increase the number of strains and the amount of strains of good guys that we have. 100%. So let's kind of dive in to uh, the aspect of when probiotics go wrong or when probiotics create negative symptoms. So one of the first things, if we have a lot of bad bacteria in our gut, right, dysbiotic bacteria, right, this could come up on a stool test, we may run a breath test and see various gases at higher levels like methane or hydrogen. These gases can disrupt motility, right? More methane gas can create constipation, more hydrogen gas can create diarrhea. Sometimes they're just alternating between between the two. And when we have a higher amount of bad bacteria, like what's bad bacteria? So we could have overgrowth of E. coli or Citrobacter or Klebsiella or Proteus, or um, there's a bunch of other ones out there, Pseudomonas, uh, Mirabilis, right? It's different species of bad bacteria. These critters, when exposed to probiotics, because probiotics are essentially a fermentable compound, right? So they're kind of in that FODMAP family, right? FODMAP stands for fermentable, oligodisaccharide, mono, and polyols. Polyols being like xylitol, erythritol, right? So they're kind of in that fermentable aspect of FODMAP. So a lot of people with SIBO or generalized dysbiosis, right? Generalized dysbiosis just means there's a bad bacterial overgrowth. SIBO says specifically where that bad bacterial overgrowth is, i.e. the small intestine. When you consume these beneficial bacteria, there can be a war in your tummy where those beneficial bacteria ferment and feed some of that dysbiotic bacteria and can create more gases. And those gases can then disrupt motility, either create tummy aches, nausea, can throw off motility and, and either increase constipation or increase diarrhea. And it sounds a little bit cliche because we've said it so many times, but we talk about the order of operations with fixing the gut. And we talk about how you don't want to fertilize the garden before you pull the weeds. And that's essentially what you're saying. Because if we come in, let's say we have Jane Doe who comes in the door, she has gut complaints, maybe it's gas, bloating, burping, constipation, etc. And she's been on probiotics, she went to Whole Foods and bought some and she felt bad, she doesn't know why we're going to run a comprehensive stool test on her, we're going to run an organic acid urine test on her, and we're going to look at it. And if we see that there's all these major overgrowths, you're talking about pseudomonas and morganella and streptococcus and staph and whatever else, we're typically going to pull them off the probiotics immediately. And then we're going to come in with what probably some kind of an antimicrobial antifungal herb combo. 100%. Now, one of the things that I see at my new patient consult, and I'm dealing with patients for the first time, we're typically dealing with patients that are already making a lot of diet changes. One of the first questions I ask is, how do you tolerate fermentable foods? Like when you have kimchi or sauerkraut or some kombucha, how do you do with it? And they either tell me they do great, or they have a lot of negative symptoms. Anytime someone tells me they have negative symptoms, I automatically know there's more than likely a bad bacterial overgrowth there. And it's to the point where that small amount of beneficial bacteria from the fermentation process is feeding that bad bacteria and you're getting a feeding frenzy, right? You chum what would the water that mean? and now sharks are there. What would that mean when you say, yes, Dr. J, I do kombucha and I feel bad. What are you expecting these people to report from that? They're talking about typically some level of bloating or gas or some type of motility issue, slow or fast motility, diarrhea, constipation. And then of course, um, you may even get um, belching, bloating, those kind of things on top of it. So those are the biggies. And then when we see that happening, it's usually the bacteria is just feeding off of the fermentable carbohydrate and is then now spitting out excess methane or hydrogen gas that's creating those symptoms. And it could even be throwing off motil uh, throwing off digestion too, because when you're, when you're really gassy and you're really bloaty, 
it's possible that there's not a lot of stomach acid there and that could create more stress in the intestinal tract, thus decreasing enzymes and acid production. So it's very possible that now we have poor digestion and then when we eat our next meal, it may be even harder to break down. So all those things are very possible when we have this level of bacterial overgrowth and probiotics come into the mix. So first check mark is, hey, how do you feel when you consume fermentable foods? Do you feel neutral, better, worse? Where are you at with that? It's the first let's, question I ask. Let's throw in the brain too, because someone oh, yeah. listening- the brain fog, I'm sorry, the brain fog is, is one, now the, another big one, uh, but we can talk about why that is too. That's, that's a whole other mechanism. Okay. Yeah. But that's what I was going to mention because somebody listening to what you just said, they're going to go, okay, great. He said this, 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 and that. I don't have any of those gut symptoms. I just get so brain fog. I can't even find where I put my phone or my keys after I drink kombucha. Yes. What the heck does that mean? So we're just talking about kind of the, the SIBO um, gas kind of mechanism. The other mechanism that we may see could be coming from histamine or various biological amines that are produced from the probiotics, right? So we could have a histamine release from the probiotics, right? Or a, a biological amine stimulation, which is then gonna, you know, the, the common histamine side effects or symptoms come into play. This could be headaches, this could be brain fog or cognitive issues. So yeah, that's a really good call on that. That kind of goes outside of just the, the SIBO, methane, hydrogen kind of gas thing. That's, that's more of a histamine kind of response. Yeah, because that was me. I mean, I didn't have that many gut symptoms. I remember being down in Austin. There's like, that's like the kombucha capital down there. And it is. we were trying a bunch of different ones. We'd go out to like a grass fed burger joint, get kombucha on tap, and I would drink it. And it was like I was drunk. And I was like, whoa, I had major cognitive issues. So I think there probably was a histamine component, but I, I believe that whole acetyl aldehyde issue is probably part of it as well. You and I have talked about this idea of a candida overgrowth producing this acetyl aldehyde or other toxins. And it's similar to an alcohol molecule where people are basically getting drunk on their own internal alcohol production. And so that can, for, for me, I, I think that can be a sign that something's going on as well. Yeah. I mean, with probiotics that they can, you know, you can have a little bit of alcohol production as a byproduct of, of fermentation, right? That's how alcohol is made. So there's a tiny bit there. All right. That, that is also possible. Um, number two is histamine dilates blood vessels, right? And it brings immune cells to the area. That's part of how the immune system works. Like if you go bump your elbow, it starts to swell up. Why does it swell up? That's histamine. Well, why is it swelling? It's swelling because the immune system is trying to open up blood vessels to help with the inflammation. So that's kind of like the whole idea is you don't want the immune response to go over too much. And that's why you ice it down to keep it from getting too swelling. But there's a combination of you want some of that there. But when you're eating histamine and that immune reaction is happening, and let's say those blood cells, uh, those white blood cells are going to your brain. Well, we know the more immune activity activity in the brain can cause more brain fog, right? We know the microglial cells in the brain, when overly activated can create brain fog. And so if you're noticing, you know, more swelling, more redness, more itchiness, more cognitive issues, more headaches, um, that could be a big issue. Now, you could always just try consuming more DAO enzyme with the, his with the probiotics, with the fermented foods. You could also look at doing oral probiotics that are lower in histamine species, like the lactobacillus paracasei is one that's a, a higher histamine one as well. The lactobacillus helveticus is another one. Uh, lactobacillus helgardi and thermophilus and buckneri are going to be lactobacillus species that are higher in histamine. So there are some species that will be lower. You can also try even consuming more soil or spore based probiotics, which can be helpful too. And, and, or just consuming some extra DAO while taking the probiotic, see if that neutralizes it as well. So a couple of little experiments you can do to see if that moves the needle in the right direction. So let's talk about the fact that when you address the gut, that your tolerance is going to improve of probiotics, right? Even if you, let's say you come in and let's say you've got a bunch of parasites and bacterial overgrowth going on. If you come in and bring herbs in just at the end of that protocol to eradicate or reduce those infections, you should in theory tolerate probiotics better. Is this true? So repeat that one more time. I want to make sure I grabbed all that. Just knocking down the bugs alone. You're going to yes. tolerate probiotics more. So a couple things. It just depends. So patients come in, they're telling me, hey, I have problems with fermented foods. So one of the first things that we're going to do is we're going to go on a lower FODMAP diet and we're going to starve out some of these critters. So the first mechanism is we're starving. So lower FODMAP kind of template, 
cutting out the fermentable oligodisaccharide mono and polyol foods, that creates a starvation-like effect. And that can beat down the critters without having to kill them just by cutting down their fuel source. It's kind of like yeast and sugar, right? You go lower sugar, lower carb, you can starve out some of the candida. That is one of the first things. And then we work on digesting as well, because if we have a lot of bacterial overgrowth, we know low stomach acid is a common issue with bacterial overgrowth. So we work on good enzymes, good acid production. We make sure that we're digesting our food well and we have good motility. If we're going to the bathroom every two, three days, well, we're making ourselves toxic through our toxins in our, in our stool. So, we, so there's like the six hour approach that I've done for a decade here and it goes with every patient. And now what, there's different aspects of each R that we'll talk about that we can implement. So the first R is removing the bad foods. Now, for some patients, that could be a paleo template. For some, that's a paleo autoimmune, low FODMAP. Some it's carnivore. Some it's a low salicylate, low, low FODMAP kind of SED template. There's, there's different ways and different levers that we can move within that first remove R. The second R is to replace an, um, enzyme, replace acid, maybe bile salt, maybe, maybe bitters. It depends on how good or bad someone's guts, guts at for that. The third R is going to be repairing the digestive tract or and, and or repairing the hormones because hormones are, especially adrenal, they play a huge role in reducing inflammation. And people that have a lot of gut issues, their immune system is overstressed. They're usually inflamed and they're also pretty tired. So getting good hormone support can decrease inflammation, help with energy, help with mood. The fourth R is going to be removing the infections where we go after things in order of operations. So there's different... H. pylori, there's yeast, there's parasites, there's bacterial overgrowth. There's an order of how we hit those for best success. And this is where the killing of a lot of this stuff comes into play. So the first major component that allows us to be able to potentially, let's say, get exposed to FODMAPs or probiotics in the future and be able to tolerate it is first starve things out. The second thing is kill things. And the third thing is going to be crowded out. And then once we've done that fourth R, the remove R, then we, with, we use specific botanicals to help knock these herbs down or knock these critters down, which then allow us to handle probiotics or fermentable foods is now repopulating, re-inoculating with probiotics. And we may choose different species depending on what you can or can't handle. So typically I'll come in there and I'll challenge and see if our probiotic intolerance has changed. And we may add in different lactobacillus species, or we may go to more spore-based species or saccharomyces species or low histamine species. So I'll kind of test it in between and we'll see what works. And then we retest. We want to make sure that infections are gone and no new infections have come back. Sometimes a infection that wasn't there originally could come back like H. pylori or a parasite. So you have to test it on both sides to ensure that we're knocking it out. Are you going to it does. Are you going to retest before or after probiotics? Like, let's say you do a round of herbs, knock bugs down, then you come in probiotics. Are you going to test after that? Or are you going to kill, test, see what the results are, then maybe kill again, then do probiotics? I typically retest about one month into probiotics. And the reason why I do is because probiotics can help reduce inflammation, right? So if someone's guts inflamed, you're going to see a, a major improvement inflammation wise post probiotics, or at least you know, give it enough runway for them to work. I find that a month is usually pretty darn good. And then number two, the immune system can improve with probiotics. So we can see improvements in IgA and we know probiotics can help with digestion too. Um, and then I would say the, the third thing after that is probiotics have been shown to help improve gut permeability, partly through, I think, inflammation, partly through crowding bugs out. They can help with gut permeability, hence autoimmune stuff. And so those are the big reasons why immune digestion and gut permeability significantly can improve and inflammation reduction can improve post probiotic. So I give it about a month or so because I find patients gut settle much better. Yep. Yep. Good call. Uh, what That's do you great. notice clinically? Well, I mean, it depends because if you come in, let's say you take Joe, who's got all these gut symptoms, he showed up with three parasites, H. pylori, he's done triple therapy. So he's already been on antibiotics, you know, his guts a mess, he's got cow protecting through the roof, we might come in and do six to eight weeks of herbs. And then I'll let him just kind of rest, not even probiotics yet, depending on how he's feeling, maybe some gut soothing herbs just sprinkled in for a couple of weeks, just to see how he feels when he gets off the antimicrobials. And then if he's off for a week or two, then we'll kind of debate, okay, based on the progress report, do we go into gut healing probiotics yet? Well, you know what, I'm still having major 
uh, inconsistencies with my bowel. Some days it's loose, some days it's good, some days I'm really tired, some days I'm really bloated. Okay, sounds like there's an issue still going. So sometimes I'll come in and just go ahead and run a second round of, of herbs to knock bugs down. Then go into either gut healing probiotics and then a retest. So it depends on the person, like every answer we talk about. Yeah, some people do really great with probiotics afterwards. Some can get a little bit of a loose stool. So I always try to ease it in there. But I find most people are going to do much better. Again, my analogy is this, right? You go to the garden, you don't go throw down seeds when there's a whole bunch of weeds in the garden. You, you kind of get the weeds pulled up. Why? That creates space for the seeds to grow, right? Weeds will outcompete the seeds. And when the seeds start to grow, any anyone that's good in lawn care will tell you once you have a really good foundation for good grass growing, the good healthy grass will actually crowd out weeds from growing. So I kind of use that philosophy, clean it up, really get some good seeds down, really work on that good healthy gut microbiome through through healthy diet and through you know good you know decreased consumption of sugar and refined processed crap. Maybe add in a little bit of carbohydrate that may help feed gut bacteria very very gently. And that allows that the grass to grow, which then outcompetes a lot of the bad critters. So we de-weed or de-weed first and then throw down the seeds second, right? You go to the car wash, you get the car washed. If you go to the automatic car wash, right? You go in, what's the first thing that happens? It washes your car first, soap it, wash it, rinse it, and then it waxes it, right? Then it puts the wax or the rain on afterwards. You never put the, the wax on a dirty car. You got to clean the car off first before you get the wax on. Think of the wax as the probiotics in this nature. Yep. And we're not coming in with antibiotics ever because we don't prescribe that stuff. When somebody comes in, I had a woman last week, unfortunately, she had double whammy, C. diff and H. pylori, and she had already been through the triple therapy. So the doctors gave her all sorts of very, very powerful antibiotics. She did it for months and months and months. We retest her stool. She still has C. diff. She still has H. pylori. So we're coming in with now botanicals instead. And luckily the success rate is very good. And the bacteria in general haven't developed any sort of resistance to the uh, herbs. So if you're someone listening and you're saying, well, why is your all's method better? Well, because the antibiotics, there's this antibiotic resistance phenomenon going on. And the same thing's happening with fungus. Now the CDC is freaking out about candida, believe it or not. They've got this huge bulletin about candida. Oh my God, the antifungal drugs aren't working anymore. Well, luckily the antifungal herbs we use still work great and far better and safer than the drugs. Well, the problem with, with the antibiotics is the antibiotics don't really address the efflux pumps that dysbiotic or you know bad bacteria use. So efflux pumps, essentially, think of like you're in a canoe, right? And the canoe's got a hole in it and you start taking on water, right? Ideally, if you're in that canoe and you don't do anything, what happens to the canoe? Yeah, you're going to sink. Sinks, right? So think of efflux pumps as giving someone a bucket and allowing them to bail that water out of the canoe. If you're bailing water out of the canoe at the same speed that it's coming in, you can stay afloat theoretically, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? So think Uh of the efflux pumps as giving that bad bacteria a bucket to bail that antibiotic back out into the intercellular space. And so essentially these Efflux pumps are like this bucket bailing the antibiotic back into the intercellular space. So some of these herbs actually have efflux pump inhibitor aspects to it. So it's like ripping away that bucket from that person on the canoe so they can't bail water. Now the canoe is is doomed to sink. Now that bacteria is doomed to take on that antimicrobial compound and sink or be eradicated faster. Does that make sense? It does. And we've talked about that before. I think I think we talked about berberine and efflux pumps, didn't we? Maybe it berberine, was mastic- berberine and artemisia have really good success together. And a lot of these herbs work very good synergistically. And that's the other hard part uh, we were talking about before we hit record on talking about studies. You know, you'll look at this one strain or this one herb isolated, but we never do that. I mean, we may use five, 10, 15 herbs in combination. And no, that doesn't mean we're going to sell you 15 bottles. That means we have formulas that we have where we've got five to 10 herbs in one formula. So if you take one capsule, you're getting a broad spectrum of all sorts of antifungal, antimicrobial, antiparasitics right. together. And how in the world can you ever quantify the synergistic effects of herbs? I just don't know of a way to do it. Also the amount, the potency, right? You know, yeah. very, very high levels so we can have a therapeutic effect. Like we talked about the whole pixie dusting effect. There's a lot of people that sell 
some of these compounds online and it looks pretty looking at the back of the ingredients, but you need the potency. So when we have, when we have our patients taking it, then microbials, I mean, the dose is pretty strong to ensure that we're going to have a therapeutic effect. Yeah. I did a little plug, um, before one of my podcast episodes the other day. So I'm going to just say kind of what I said in that plug, which was that you and I are working with people clinically. We're in the trenches. We're not just reading like a PubMed article, then doing a podcast and trying to show that like, we're the boss, we're the experts here. We learn from the studies and papers, sure, but the most we learn is from clinically working with thousands of people and implementing things and figuring out what works and what doesn't, and then tweaking the game plan according to that. And so when it comes to supplements and herbs and nutrients we're using, they're all top, top, top tier. You can only access these herbs and nutrients and even get available products to put it in a bottle if you're a practitioner. So we're not doing consumer uh, manufacturing, contract manufacturing, where you're just grabbing random herbs in a warehouse, throwing a label on it and putting it on Amazon. No, we have practitioners sort of over our heads that are helping to monitor the quality, the purity, the potency, they're testing for mold and mycotoxins and heavy metals and all that. So if you ever buy anything from us, whether you're a client patient or not, uh, just know that you're getting some legit good stuff. Absolutely. Also, a couple other components I wanted to highlight is some probiotics, they're grown in the base of dairy. So if you're getting probiotics that could have some dairy in it, whether it's the casein in the dairy, that's the protein, or whether it's lactose, that could potentially create a a side issue. So a lot of times the probiotics that we're using and that we create, they're going to typically be dairy free. So if there's any dairy sensitivity issues, we can kind of pull that variable out. So in my line, I use one called ProBioFlora. It's got 12 to 13 lactobacillus and bifidobacter species that are that work phenomenal, very potent, and they're also going to be dairy free as well. So that's one that I've used, ProBioFlora. I'll put the link down below. Also, a high quality Saccharomyces boulardii, which does work excellent. It can have really good immune benefits and anti candida benefits too. And then I'll also have specific spore based probiotics. So one of the ones that I've been using for a while is mega spore biotic, which I I do like, I think it works really, really good. I like that. And these probiotics can hang around a lot longer. They can potentiate a lot of the growth of other bacteria so they can help some of the other good bacteria grow. Probiotics don't last forever. So like the whole idea that like, I'm just, I'm putting bacteria in my tummy and they're going to be there forever. Probably not the case. Usually it's about a, a four week kind of transient cycle. That's why getting exposed to good probiotics, whether it's from supplement or from fermented foods, kind of more on a regular basis is good. I always tell patients, you know, get a bottle of probiotics in your system probably every quarter. Um, If, you know, as just a good rule of thumb, even if you are not consuming, even if you're consuming fermentable carbohydrates and you can tolerate them, i.e. kombucha, kimchi, sauerkraut, get a bottle of probiotics in once a quarter. Or number two, if you can't tolerate any fermented foods at all, then you should be taking probiotics, you know, at least one or two capsules daily. You know, in my line, we're typically doing, you know, 40 to 80 billion probiotics therapeutically. If you go too much higher than that, probiotics can have a cathartic like effect. They can really crowd out ecological niches of bad bacteria. So you have to be careful. I always recommend starting a little bit low. And usually people are packaging about maybe five to 20 billion per capsule or so. And then you can kind of start with, you know, one to four, maybe up to six caps max on that and see how you do. And again, when we manufacture our probiotics, you'll see on the outer label CFU, which stands for colony forming units. And we'll say how many colony forming units are in there. When we say how many CFUs are in there, we're stating how much is there at expiration, not at manufacture. At manufacturing, there's actually far more to compensate for the loss just of heat and transportation. So we always overpack it. So what you see as CFU is at expiration. And a lot of the cheaper probiotics you see, it's the opposite. They say what's in there at manufacturing and what's in there at expiration ends up being far less. And that's a little trick the supplement industry uh, puts out. That's a little bit deceiving. That's why you want to spend good money on good probiotics that are going to label it more accurately. Yeah, great point. And that's just another reason that we get five star reviews clinically and on the podcast too. So thanks for reviewing the podcast, but the clinical things, you know, the most Mm -hmm. important to us, because at the end of the day, if we give you something and sell it to you, and we don't get the result, 
You're not going to be happy. You're not going to tell your friends, your family, you're not going to get them on board. So we have to perform. We kind of have this performance pressure on us. And so, yeah, we can't play around. And I've had too many people go to Trader Joe's and I bought the probiotic at Trader Joe's and it did nothing. It's like, oh my God, let's open that can of worms. It's not apples to apples. Yeah. When you are facing the people that are buying the products you're recommending and you need to, ther you need to perform therapeutically, you can't cut corners on quality and potency and purity. You just can't do it because you develop a reputation through getting people better. And it's like, if I'm a painter and I'm painting your house, I'm not going to just use the cheapest paint. And then in three or four years, you're pissed off because you have to paint the house 10 years early. You choose the highest quality paint. So you have the best result, right? Same thing in the supplement industry. Um, you can get the cheapest stuff or you can buy the more expensive stuff. You can buy meat that's McDonald's quality. You can buy meat that's from the grass fed organic farmer down the street, right? So we want to choose that highest quality. Which probiotics are in your line, Evan? I know mine's the Probioflora. I have Sacroflora. I do a Megaspore that I special order that I carry that one at my store. I love those. What do you use? Nice. My two, well, I guess I have three bestsellers. The Probiomyces, same thing. Freeze-dried Saccharomyces boulardii. Probiomyces, yep. it's amazing. The Probiosphere, like these little balls with, yep. the, with the delayed release technology in them. That's nice. And then the probiotic pro like professional, that's the one that's the dairy free. So that's the one with the phage in there, the prebiotic phage and the yep. probiotic. And that one is, it's killer for IBS and UTIs. It's hard to believe that you could put something in the gut and, and positively improve UTIs, but it works like a charm for that. Exactly. Now people always ask probiotics, should you do it with food or an empty stomach? I kind of default to an empty stomach um, just because it, some of these probiotics, these bacteria can be, let's just say, killed with acid. Now, the spore-based probiotics tend to be able to be acid resistant. So you can do this with food. There's some beneficial effects of taking probiotics with food, though, from a digestive standpoint. So probiotics can actually help improve digestion on one side. But on the other side, though, if you're trying to have more of a repopulation, re-inoculation effect, I recommend an empty stomach. But some people see an improvement with digestion taking fermented food or probiotics with it. That's why some people, they feel really good having their kombucha after their meal. They just feel like, oh, I feel really good on my digestion side. That's because of the acidity and, and um, some of the, the, um, the various acids that are in the kombucha can really help stimulate digestive acids, I think, especially if it's ginger, then you have some bitters in there that can stimulate more digestive juices as well. So I think that's a component, but uh, I typically default to an empty stomach. Your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I think I agree. I mean, I think it's case by case before bed could be good too. Like if your gut's real irritated and it's affecting your sleep, I've had some people with IBS where they're up in the middle of the night with cramping and such, you know, we'll do like some of my GI Sooth too, which is an aloe extract. We'll do that with probiotics before bed and people will report, Hey, I slept through the night because I was in less pain with my gut. So. Yeah. Some patients that really have a hard time with probiotics as we introduce them back in on an empty stomach, I'll start with a little bit with the food just as a, as a way to start getting it. Sometimes they can tolerate with food, but not quite on an empty stomach. So I'll kind of inch in that way too. So it just depends, like you said, case by case basis. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard, right? We're trying to take a thousand different ways that it's happened before and distill it into one podcast to refer to. It's like, oh, it's a little tricky. Exactly. Anything <laughs> else you want to highlight today? I mean, we've been going pretty good for a while. We're on a good clip here. Anything else you want to highlight? Uh, yeah, just one, one real quick study here that was regarding anxiety and gut bacteria. There's many studies out there. If you just type in probiotic anxiety in PubMed, you can look at it, but there was a mental health center in Shanghai and they reviewed 21 studies that looked at 1500 people. Long story short, the probiotics versus the placebo group, the anxiety in these people was significantly reduced. So like the, we know the rhamnosis in particular is very beneficial, but there's others as well. So depression, same thing. You could find studies on bipolar and depression and all sorts of mood issues. And duh, you and I talked about this, but we'll say it again before we wrap up. A lot of the neurotransmitters, a lot of the brain chemistry is happening first in the gut. So serotonin's happening in the gut. The gut bacteria are producing toxins affecting neurotransmitters. So you've got to fix the gut to fix the brain in many, many cases with mental health. So if you're depressed, if you're anxious, if you're angry, if you're irritable, consider the gut. Love it, Evan. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Well, let's wrap it up here. Today was a really great chat. If you guys enjoy it, put your comments down below. 
Let us know your experience with probiotics, beneficial bacteria. Let us know the good and bad and kind of what's giving you all the best results. And if you guys want to dive in, you can work with Evan, evanbrand.com. You work with me, Dr. J, at justinhealth.com. And we are available worldwide to help patients out during this time. So feel free and reach out. And we'll put probiotics link down below so you can see the actual ones that we recommend. And if you want to support us, we always appreciate it. We're trying to provide the highest quality products that we can to y'all. Anything else, Evan? That's it. Have a great day. Take care. Take care, y'all. Bye now. Bye.